Hey everyone, welcome back to Intersections, Mission to Innovate. I'm Gracie Davidson and with me are Quan Collins and Prachisi Tanka here in the Spark Studio. And in this episode, we're going to take a deep dive in discussing the top barriers to innovation. And to do so, we're joined by two guests today, Natalie Foley and Kevin Landtroop. Both Natalie and Kevin have been enablers and stewards of the innovation ecosystem, and they bring their deep expertise and stories to you. So brace yourself for an exciting and stimulating conversation as we look at the innovation space through multiple lenses today. Hey everyone, welcome back to episode five of Intersections. Joining me, Prachi and Quan, are Kevin and Natalie. I'm so excited to hear what they say. I'm going to kick it off to you, Quan, so we can get started. Thanks, Gracie. Thanks, Prachi. And welcome, Kevin and Natalie. We are so excited for you to join us on Episode 5, Barriers to Innovation. Such an exciting topic. So before we get started, just for you guys, you know, I know we've had a couple episodes. You may or may not have listened. Hopefully you have listened to some of our previous (laughs) episodes. But we talk about intersections, right? And the intersections are this combination of disciplines, domains, ideas, people, and what is that cross-section that's sort of special, you know, that happens when we talk about innovation, right, in this context of building these cultures of innovation, collaboration, uh, learning. So we, in our previous episodes, we've kind of defined the what to do, why we need to do it, some of the, you know, the things like mindfulness that's required to get into the right mindset around innovation. And so today we wanted to talk to you both as practitioners and trying to make all this work in your own intersections. Um, What's working, what's not working, and obviously with our title Barriers to Innovation, a little bit of a focus of where the challenges really are and why is it still complex, right? Why is it so hard for us to get past some of those challenges? So with that, uh, hand it over to Prachi for some more context. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Kwan, and hi, Natalie, and hi, Kevin. So look, Kwan, I mean, we've been talking about all these awesome solutions and levers and techniques, and that's great and that's important. But look, some of this is happening only in pockets and not at scale, right? Like, I mean, that's the reality, which is why I feel strongly that we absolutely need to step back, put that critical lens, really gather around. Look, I mean, in episode one, we talk about this cafe-like setting where, you know, we're just sitting around a, a little cafe table with friends having a very open, honest, and transparent dialogue. So this is exactly how that feels like, right? So let's just talk about barriers to innovation. Thinking of an analogy from some of the agile routines, this feels like a retrospective almost, Mm -hmm. where we can have a forum where we can talk about what is not working. And of course, to have a good retrospective, it's always better to have more than two people. So again, we are so glad to have you, Natalie and Kevin. And Kevin, you and I are not strangers, but you and Kwan have certainly, you know, worked longer together. So Kwan, can you tell us a little bit about like how you met Kevin, how you work together, and we'll get this party going. That sounds great. Well, Kevin, I guess we met about four years ago back in Austin, Texas, when I was was uh, new to the area and we opened our office in the Capital Factory. And I would really say that everything that I observed in the Capital Factory and the work that you and I did together there was really inspiration for what we're talking about today. So Capital Factory for our listeners is a startup accelerator. They like to call it the center of gravity for startups in the state of Texas, which is cool. And what I found really interesting was the integration of not only the startup community, but large businesses like SAIC, Amazon, Google, and the government. So there was an entire floor at the Capital Factory that was dedicated to government that was interested in figuring out this problem of how to accelerate innovation and how to bring non-traditional companies to the table um, so that they could, you know, see what what was the best of breed, what the, what that community was thinking about, and how to move fast, right? So learn from that culture of startups and and venture capital. Um, so Kevin and I worked together and and struggled over this problem of how we make this you know relationship work. So over to you, Kevin, for some introduction here. Thanks, Quan um, and Prachi, and thanks for inviting me to speak with you guys today. So uh, a little background about me. I uh, graduated from West Point, spent some time as a cavalry officer. I also uh, went to the University of Texas in Austin for law school, spent some time as an attorney. On the institutional side of the Department of Defense, I directed ops for a huge organization, as well as uh, worked on capabilities development inside the DOD. I did a whole bunch of rotations out at the National Training Center, which is you know where you get to see really how poorly, as a force, we connect data 
and decision and effects and did all that stuff in environments ranging from contentious to full-blown combat on five different continents. Uh, but when I came to Austin, which was shortly before I met you, Quan, um, I came here to help startups connect to DOD problems. And when I started, I realized they're working on solutions that were relevant to some of the things the DOD needed, but they didn't speak the language. They didn't understand military systems or operating context, and they really didn't understand contracting. Like, how does the government buy things? And so I started the Texas Defense Innovation Forum to give companies those basics. Like, how do I get a cage code? Where do I start applying and competing and performing on contracts? Do I go to the GSA and try to get scheduled or do I do an R&D contract? And then, like, what's the difference between, like, AFWorks and a program executive office? Like, those kind of basic things. And then we get into more details uh, and complex stuff like cybersecurity requirements and um, international trafficking and arms regulations and, you know, foreign ownership and control and those types of things. Um, but we did that through a defense academy, and our first one had 22 attendees, and 18 of those companies ended up winning phase two awards. And so I'm like, wow, we, we've got something here, right? Um, and that was about the time that I jumped into Capital Factory. They opened up the Center for Defense Innovation, and I got to scale that model. And over the first year, uh, we had about 200 active companies. We got 30 of those companies awards that totaled around 60 million that first year, which was which was also cool. But then COVID happened, and I decided to try something new. So I went to a company, which is where I met Prachi. Um, it was an art artificial intelligence company that spun out of a defense-focused subsidiary called Spark Cognition Government Systems. And I led their BD team and quadrupled the team and the bookings uh, in one year. And then I got mired in Salesforce, and I didn't really like that all that much. So I decided to leave. And now I'm working with a company called Cyber Advisors. And Cyber Advisors is really, really good at helping startups win R&D contracts. So going back to the basics of what we started with, um, except with, with more specific support for the individual companies. Uh, but my role in the company is to help transition that technology from or into production and deployment. Um, and the reason why is because if we can do that, then we'll actually impact the mission instead of just building a bunch of science projects. And the second thing is we create um, something that the investors will understand, right? Recurring revenue contracts that contribute to the valuation of the company. Um, so, so that's what I'm working on. I guess in addition to all of that, I teach a course at the University of Texas called Hacking for Defense. That's awesome, Kevin. You are certainly a person of multiple talents. And I have to say, I feel the same way about Natalie. She's truly a polymath. So Natalie, before I ask you for your introduction, I have to tell the little story of how we met. So uh, I saw you first when I took the design thinking certification online, which was through University of Virginia's uh, Darden Business School. And Natalie was one of the lecturers there. It was a completely virtual forum. So I didn't really meet her, but I just did a complete, I think, cold reach out over LinkedIn. And we just kind of hit it off. And then we ended up taking a, a joint workshop for almost three hours through Northern Virginia Technology Council. And we talked about the intersection of design thinking and digital transformation. And I remember like before, during, and after that workshop, we were having just so much fun and we were laughing so much, like people stopped and asked like, what is going on? Why are you so happy? Right. So over to you, Natalie, for your introduction. Tell us a little bit about your background and uh, love to hear about your experiences as the CEO of Peer Insight as well. Yeah, you bet. Um, thank you, Prachi. I was just, you know, and y'all know you're focused a lot on intersections and it's just funny that we met with an intersection. We're like, yeah, what, what, are, what is the intersection of these two? Let's, let's dig in. And I could not have asked for a more fun, curious uh, person to dig in with that. So Excited to always be in dialogue uh, with you and, and everybody on this call and listening to. Uh, for me, I mean, my journey started as a problem solver, uh, joining PricewaterhouseCoopers as a consultant. I had never taken a business class before in college, um, but was really hooked when somebody said that in consulting, you get to solve problems on teams. I'm like that, that's me in a nutshell. And, um, and I like teams. I'm pretty equal opportunist when it comes to the problems um, that we're solving. And I really like stretching across industries and sectors. So for me, kind of joining a problem solving unit right away and kind of learning sort of the basics, but a lot of the problems that we're solving um, at PricewaterhouseCoopers and then IBM bought the group I was in was, you know, how to improve the core business. And there was, I, I enjoyed that, but I was also curious about tackling carrier problems, more social challenges that were bigger in scale. Uh, and challenges of growth of what's new and what's and what's next. But meanwhile, I was also kind of pulling on a thread of working in international development. That was a calling that came after 9-11 for me. 
um, of, you know, if maybe we can give, you know, a better economic environment in different parts of the world, things would be better. And so set off to join USAID and got to work in Afghanistan overseas a little bit in that too, but also realized that um, nation building is a tough business to be in and very long-term. And, but I was seeing the, I was seeing how the private sector and some of the private sector mentality and problem solving was, was really making changes on the ground, right? Even in really, really difficult circumstances to say the least. Um, too. And that led me to business school. And that was a really reluctant MBA, as, a, as I say, would have never, you know, have predicted that on there. But while I was there, I kept searching for this, you know, tools to add to my toolkit um, to say, okay, now I feel smarter about tackling problems, right? Because you think you're, you know, you think you're joining these cool firms with these good names, like my graph of me getting smarter should be going up, right? And then the problems you solve keep getting harder. And you're like, actually, I'm flatlining. You know, I need to understand some more. And so in some cases, that's where, how you always want to feel. Um, but, but for me, it was really about, you know, finding design thinking and, and learning some of the tools that come from innovation. We're like, ah, this, this is going to help me solve problems that are not solved yet. And like in business school terms, where you kind of have the case with the data in the back and you just look at the data, there's no data, right? There's no, no rules that have been written yet. And that was really exciting to me. So um, I joined Peer Insight right after uh, business school because I wanted to both run and grow a firm while I was also learning this toolkit and consulting to other folks. So I got to do both of those and served as CEO for the la my last four years and actually just left um, the very end of last year. And I'm sort of in an exploration mode and helping uh, a friend part time at a climate change nonprofit as chief of staff to the CEO and COO there too, and learning more about that space. So that's kind of been my journey. And I'm in a very odd, reflective time right now trying to embrace that feeling too. But yeah, that's a little bit of my, my background, but it is the intersection piece is fun right now, particularly in kind of the intersection of what I learned in the private sector with some NGO and climate change and behavior change, all kind of overlapping in a big Venn diagram, which is fun. I love that story, Natalie, and especially about the learning curve, right? That you think you're going to get smarter, the problems are getting harder. Um, when I was working on my dissertation, it was like, the more I learned, the dumber I felt because I yeah, was yeah. like, there's so much I don't understand yeah. about what's happening. Um, but yeah, I know story. exactly now what I don't know, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I know too much about what I don't know. Well, Kevin, back to you. So you mentioned a little bit about, right, what you started with the Texas Defense Innovation Forum, and then the Center for Innov Defense Innovation at the Capitol Factory. Can you speak specifically now, like dig a little bit deeper around the challenges and barriers that you saw, you know, in particular with connecting, right, startups, helping them to understand all those things about government acquisition that is almost innovation crushing in some ways? Yeah, well, I mean, in, you know, talking about intersections and overlaps, in, in this case, it's trying to overlap a bunch of different sectors. It's tech and business and finance and academic and government. You know, innovation and modernization for national security isn't really just about technologies or widgets. It's new business models that are bringing together the speed of, of innovation and the range of different activities from the venture and startup community with the ruggedness and the dependability of the defense and the aerospace domains and the traditional uh, industrial base that supports it. I, I think about it as you've got to create an infrastructure to find emerging innovative technologies to derive whatever the dual use capability is. Um, that's the military application, you know, develop, test, validate that use case and that technology, um, and then integrate, right? These things with the intersections, none of the technologies of the companies that I work with are going to solve a problem in the field on its own. It's gonna have to integrate with something. And even if it's as simple as an app that's gonna live like in platform one, it still has to be able to onboard into that system, right? So that users can access it and then scale and deploy. And this is where it gets really messy you know, manufacturing challenges, delivery challenges. Um, in some instances, you have to change like doctrine, like how people do their jobs um, so that they can use whatever this new tool is. Um, and while we're doing all of this, we have to continue to allow startups to be able to remain focused on the commercial markets so that their VC doesn't dry up, right? Because the investors will eventually get stale on this. Um, and that means they have to be able to compete for big renewable contracts. You know, it's a, it's a complex system 
and we're just getting started with DIU and AFWorks and Army Applications Lab and all these other ent entities that exist in Austin at the Capital Factory. But it's it's a whole lot harder than just you know a new topic or even like the Air Force has this Strat Five program where you can turn a you know a million dollar Cyber Phase Two into a sixty million or even a hundred million public and private funded uh, R and D project. Um, but it's it's way more complex than that. That's great, Kevin. I yeah no I can tell you that both Kwan and I. I have certainly lived that world with uh, federal agencies as the customers. So a lot of that resonates. Um, I also know that, you know, when I was at SAIC, I actually had a fair amount of uh, period where I worked for commercial customers. And it's really interesting to sort of uh, step back and, and compare the two. And, and there are some, you know, differences, some similarities. And I know, Natalie, that, you know, your work has spanned the private sector. And I believe you've, you know, operated in a sort of social impact sectors also. And I think of Pure Insight as a firm that helps organizations across different sectors innovate and then, and, you know, really sort of compress that design, test, and launch life mm -hmm. cycle for new products or services. So I would love to hear more from your lens with some of the barriers that you've seen as the enabler of this innovation ecosystem. That's exactly right. I mean, we come in. Uh, usually when there's it's more of a, this is a problem we want to solve, or we think this is a problem to solve, and we'll kind of go and say, is this a problem for who, and then help figure out what's the idea, what's the concept, what's the prototype, and then into launch. Sometimes we'll come into different phases. But I was reflecting on this question ahead of time, and there's four things that, that we've seen, at least, that are barriers to it. They may not be immediate barriers, but they'll cause a thorn or a wrench at some point, too. The first sounds simple, but it's a good strategy. I think uh, for a lot of places um, in the private sector, there are a lot of things to a lot of people uh, and they have their core business that keeps the lights on and, and honestly funds any of the growth business. And so, but even sometimes then there's not a clear understanding of this is what we're doing. And, and more importantly, this is what we're not doing. So what happens is the incubator or, you know, if it's actually incubator or incubator function cranks neat things out, but if they're not really tied to it, then they shouldn't be funded. Um, too. And so sometimes it's that just is surprising. It's, it's the anchor, right? It's the goalpost at the other end of the, of the field. You should be agnostic as to how you get there, but you have a clear understanding of we need to get a hundred yards down the field to that goalpost, right? And the goalpost looks like this amount of revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Or this, this particular person that we're bringing in or this particular social impact that we're trying to create too. So that sounds, sounds really simple, but I think that that trips people up all the time because you're going back to the, why are we doing it? And the why is this important? particularly with the, the second point, which is the mindset and the systems to iterate. Iterating is not fun about it, even as a human being, right? You're like, you're trying new behaviors and testing things out is not necessarily part of our DNA, right? It's most people are trying to avoid conflict and avoid, you know, learning or growth and the itchiness that comes from that. And companies are that times a thousand. So this notion of I'm going to put out a prototype, you know, and, and not and, and test it and look for the faults in it and then make a new one and then do that again you know, this is not, not sexy stuff for the quarterly reports, right? They want to like, and we have an app, We're like we can get you an app. There's no doubt about it, but whether or not anybody will want it in a year from now is the test. And no one, there's not a lot of retrospectives, right? In the private sector or let's, let's review all the things we made mistakes on. So it sounds obvious, but I think really, really a lack of that in general too. And you mentioned earlier, Prachi, I mean, one of the things Peer Insight does is work deliberately work across sectors and deliberately work across industry. So, you know, in the course of a day, I'd have a meeting on seven different sectors, transportation, health, you know, heading into a CPG to, and then to Nike and then to ARP and um, all solving very different problems. What was interesting is everybody we kept saying like, you know, I need to have articles, you know, you need to have education to those education, health teams does health. Most of our clients didn't want that. They're like, we can't tell you how much, in, how much expertise we have in house, and that's the last thing we need more of. It's standing in our way in terms of the ability to test things, and that that's just a fascinating dichotomy in our world in general. And I'm seeing that a lot in the climate change space. Of like, I'm a scientist, and I know that X does Y. I'm like, well, is people changing their behavior on the ground? Because otherwise, so, you know, really nice that that causation happens, but what does it mean, right? How do you? translated to something. So I think that's just been an interesting phenomenon, especially the speed of the of how expertise travels um, too. But I think expertise can stand in the way, which is sounds odd uh, to say out loud. And then the last one I'd say, there's a joke about innovation theater, you know, people, the firms like, you know, starting with the cool spaces and making little trips to San Francisco, you know, as, to, to like look at stuff. 
Um, but I think there's also an innovation theater of bringing huge amounts of people to workshops, to, um, to meetings. I'm like, I, I want three people in this room to brainstorm with everybody else. I mean, we were even just joking about Let's just not give post-it notes to people. But I think it's this aura of like, sometimes in a big organization, there is time and they, mm -hmm. there is an assumption that if people come and sit at the table where the, innovate, the outside innovation team is coming in, they'll automatically learn something. We find that's generally not true. Um, and it's, so I think the power of a small team is not necessarily harnessed as much. I think there's auras of that in the legends of R&D teams and little teams working together. But sometimes I feel like when you're getting into more of the strategy or the C-suite, it's sort of everybody wants to be there to kind of see and observe and report and not miss out too. So maybe a bigger, bigger thing. But I think that, that's, that's a minor one, but I'm seeing that more and more of like, it, it, it hampers our ability to get things done and, and fast when you invite everybody into every piece. And just as a follow on there, Natalie, I mean, you, you laid out some very interesting insights there. I mean, going back to even the mindset point that you made and, and even like through your current work right now, you are getting mm -hmm. deeper into the change behavior aspect. Yeah. Do you think there is a place to sort of, you know, employ that as a, as a learned behavior? Because I think you kind of were alluding to the fact that maybe this is not something that comes naturally to people. So I'm just trying to understand, is the barrier that the right process and right behavior hasn't been taught? Mm -hmm. Or is there something more going on here, in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's, I think there's a couple sub barriers to that. Because <laughs> sure. um, that's fun, you know, getting, in, getting into the subs. One, it's time. I mean, iterating takes time. Mm -hmm. And it's viewed as you're not building something if you're iterating. Mm -hmm. um, and I think pure tech teams know that that's not true, but as, there's a, sometimes just other folks that are taught differently. Uh, I think that's part of it. You know, we would say, oh, good. I'm glad you caught that now because we only spent $25,000 mm -hmm. and a month on it, right? You're trying to de-risk this. The worst thing you could do is spend $500,000 and then learn eight months into it and you've deployed your team like the opportunity costs. Again, that retrospective, there's not an incentive to retrospect much in big organizations is my general thinking. So taking the time to go back and sort of look at what you missed, right? And, and I did a lot of sales for innovation. Like no one wants to hear like, we're going to save you wasted money. Like that, that doesn't really, mm -hmm. that, that's not sexy or interesting. And it's a lot of math, but, but the point is, is that I think there's a, there's a time factor. There's a um, tracking of, oh, this is what we thought. Like, look at what we just learned. And did, aren't you glad that we, that we shut it down and it, and a celebration of failure, but not in a failure, it's a celebration of learning, right. Of mm -hmm. saying of the curiosity and that goes back to the fixed and growth mindset. If this is a growth team, every time you shut something down, that is a huge amount of learning that, that you got from that. It's almost better than if you were successful, right. Because you learn what doesn't work. And, uh, and that's just not, there's no incentive to do that. There's no celebration of that because things are so, um, public and you're reporting out to shareholders. Yeah, that's fascinating. I loved your discussion around uh, innovation theater because there is so much focus on sort of the flashy side of this and um, not enough focus on the actual you know, the harder work that needs to get put into that and the investment that's required for the non-sexy parts of the work. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a huge issue and, and challenge for, from a reporting perspective, for sure. All right, Kevin, back to you. I love everything Natalie just said. Like, I'm like inventorying the books on the shelf here that, that cover these topics, you know, actually Lean yeah. Startups over there because I, yeah. I read a chapter of the Lean Startup almost every day just to remind myself <laughs> of what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, but, but you've clearly all... <laughs> Also read the book. I read this. I know. I was like, I bet if we got closer, it'd be like, that's my bookshelf transported. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talked about some of the success stories, Kevin, earlier, right? Some of the companies like of the, for example, in Capital Factory, the, of the 200, you know, the 30 that we were able to get on some kind of vehicle with the government. And it, from my observation, right, I think we've done a great job so far with establishing the need, right, for these communities and this intersection. And the relationships, I think, you know, in, in places like Capital Factory and what you've done with the Texas Defense Innovation Forum, what you're doing with Cyber Advisors, I think we're building really strong relationships and um, communities where we're communicating about what the government problems are and how to best work with the government. It still seems like we can't get past sort of the Cyber phase one, phase two, right? We're still very 
sort of not as impactful as we want to be, right? Not with that vision that General Murray set out when he first moved to Austin with Army Futures Command to say, we want to impact programs of record, right? So we know that, that there's still a gap. So with the model, like where where are things breaking down and what is your what is your thought on what I've just laid out there? Yeah, um, well, I mean, so lots of things have to happen. Uh, in the 2018, I think it was National Security Strategy or National Defense Strategy, which I'm sure everybody here has read, of course. <laughs> that was Multiple joke. times. I mean, right before bed. It's, yeah, it's a great read. <laughs> uh, I was just but, talking about but, the importance of a strategy, so I can appreciate yeah. it. It's like, yep, there you go. In 2018, we kind of decided that we needed to convert the National Defense Industrial Base into a National Security Innovation Base. Like, what does that mean? Well, I think over the last four years, we've learned a lot about what that means. Um, and, you know, kind of half of it is business business and technology problems. It's business models for how traditional industry works within the life cycle of a major defense acquisition program. I mean, typically those are not very lucrative on the front end, on the R&D end, but they typically are quite lucrative during life cycle sustainment, which is like 30 or 40 years, depending on what the system is. Business models for startups, right? Um, For how to find and test and integrate, deploy technology from those venture-backed companies in a way that doesn't disrupt the, you know, the ABCs of a startup, Series A, Series B, Series D, like those are each intended to, to have a specific business outcome, right, for that fundraising. And if you disrupt that, you're going to end up disrupting really the whole the whole model and the ability of startup to work. And then, you know, the technology really, the digital transformation infrastructure is kind of how I refer to it, which is the ability of the government to access data, to store data, to do DevSecOps in a secure environment, and then to deploy applications to users. I mean, that's the the business and tech side. And then you've got this kind of educational and institutional component to it. You know, you have to educate workforces about those different business models, the professionals who manage program budgets and acquisitions and who lead P&Ls inside of programs at companies like Amentum and at companies like SAIC. Like they have to understand how these two business models are not currently compatible and how we might adapt them in order to get to transition. Um, creating the business cases. Um, so Natalie talked about, you know, she talked about business cases in, in B school. So anybody who I am not an MBA, but I'm familiar with this process, right? It kind of all um, models on this Harvard Business School case study model, right? Um, well, those case studies are not written yet for this. We need to go and write those um, so that people have, you know, packets of paper to wave in front of Congress when they're asking for change. Um, and then training the workforce to employ the digital infrastructure, the digital transformation infrastructure as a weapon system. That is important. That's happening here in Austin at the Army Software Factory. It's happening around other places, but it's just getting started. And then accessing talent differently, which, you know, there are young people across the country who we should be kind of inspiring and equipping to participate. Sarah, I hope someday you join a technology company and help build a product that solves one of these problems. You know, that's one of the big goals that I have for um, teaching at Hacking for Defense. So, you know, so are we being successful? I, I like to think of it, whenever I think about the answer to that question, I think about Steve Blank's innovation pipeline, right? And on the entry side, the funnel, you've got, you know, ideas and you've got ideas and technology and problems. On the other side, you should have, you've got some process in the middle. On the other side, you should have, you know, change. Horizon one, two, three disruptions, things that are impacting how you do business and how you uh, create effects. I think we've gotten really good at the entry funnel. Um, so the department is out there in these innovation ecosystems, places like Capital Factory, up in Boston, out in the Valley. They have brands now that are attracting the types of companies that they want to attract, right? I mean, you put an X in everything and wear a T-shirt and it's all good, right? I mean, that, that's a, there's a little <laughs> bit of innovation theater in that, but it, it's also true. You know, a dot-com website integrates with Google. A dot mil website does not. Um, and everybody out there is using Chrome. So you've got, you know, the brands and they're in the right ecosystems and they're getting better at open problem statements. Like if you think about, again, that that the entry part of the funnel, it combines ideas and technology and problems. And it's an iterative process to come up with something that's actionable. And, and they're getting better at doing that, I think, to create open and semi-open problem statements. And they've turned the startup community. I mean, Dual use technology is an investment thesis today. It really wasn't five years ago. I mean, that's a huge thing. The fact that, you know, I know five or six different funds right off the top of my head that are dual Mm -hmm. use funds, right? So, and we're on a path to creating the digital transformation uh, infrastructure. So, with the Joint AI Center, you've got Joint Common Foundation, you've got data readiness and testing and evaluation efforts. Each service has some version of enterprise cloud, DevOps, and deployment. You know, the Army has, as an example, 
you know, the Enterprise Cloud Management Agency, which manages the army and the create environment where they make things and then see analytics, which is where they deploy apps. Um, I told Paul Puckett that he should call the Army Cloud Storm, but I don't think he thought that that was a great name. I think it's awesome. You know, so but, but beyond that, where we're getting started, I just see a bunch of efforts that are not really all that well connected. You know, there's 17 different flavors of talent management going on, um, everything from education to assessment. You've got software factories everywhere. I have no idea which one does what but there's a lot of them. Um, you've got all of these things that are AI efforts, right? And, and I don't know, it's not a widget. It's it's a process of using data to solve problems in a new way. But we got a lot of different things that have AI in the label um, that are probably uh, overlapping with each other. And then studies and studies and more studies, the Section 804 Commission and the National Security Commission on AI are two that, that come to mind. We got to figure out a way to connect all that stuff. And that, and that's the thing is we haven't solved the, how do we get past prototype to transition in a systematic way? So I would say we're off to a start. It's hard to say whether it's a good start or not. There's a, there's a saying in the startup world that, you know, after year one, you're always disappointed at how far you've come. And then at year five, you're shocked about how far you've come. Like, wow, I can't believe we did this. I don't know if year five is going to cut it for the DOD. They probably need at least 10. But uh, again, I, I think we're on we're on path. Kevin, I have to say, I, I loved your stream of consciousness there. And as you were, you know, describing, I was almost visualizing that funnel. And, you know, things just, I think I have to say that, you know, it's fascinating how we've gone from talking about integration to scaling and deployment problems to strategy and mindset, and then back to, you know, talent development and training. I'm going to use some of the conversation around startups as a segue to ask a question to Natalie that I've been wanting to ask for a long time, which is around the PX Ventures effort, Natalie, that you were involved in. And if I understand conceptually, it's a one-stop shop for accelerating corporate startups. So why don't you tell us a little bit more yeah. about that? And if possibly all these problems that Gavin has laid out can be solved <laughs> magically through those. <laughs> the venture shooter, that's, that's well said in a nutshell, is uh, is us drinking our own Kool Aid, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's it's saying, hey, we've been we've been trying to get large established organizations, mostly in um, the public sector and the nonprofit sector and the private sector. What have we learned? We're trying to serve their needs. What's missing there? And so for us, it was really it was solving a couple of things. One, people were well. First, let me tell you this, and then hopefully the the problem solving will be better. It is a one stop shop. It's the point of it is to be able to come to one place with one team. It's very polymath to be able to go to get support from like early upstage blue sky. Like what are the landscapes of possibilities and new things that mm -hmm. we need to solve all the way down to building. Right. And so you can really see all that in one spot. You're not piecemealing together. That's one of the problems that we saw a lot of the jumpiness of I'm going to use one team might be in internal, out, external to kind of help me do dis customer discovery. And then I have a separate team doing the business model and I have a separate team building, right? It's really saying, it's, it's the intersection thing again, like mm -hmm. I need one group of people to be able to think and speak design, tech and business all at the same time every day. So when you're running experiments, which is really the bread and butter of Peer Insight, PX Venture Studios, and when I say experiments, I mean, you have, you have a concept, you have some hypothesis of what you're trying to do and you haven't built anything yet. That is a sweet spot where you can spend not a lot of money and learn a ton if you run experiments well. And so our point in there is to say, if you're constantly running three or four in-market live experiments. You've got to constantly be looking at the data and then looking at it from a lens of business. What is it telling you about how to the business model of this? What is it telling you about whether people even want this? And then what is it telling you about how you should be building it? And so those languages coming together is, re is really important. And that was the problem that it was solving, trying to solve for. Uh, the other thing is aligning incentives. We've talked about this a little bit, but you know, most companies are very uh, comfortable with flat fee consulting, right? To McKinsey, to BCG, to, especially when you're looking at sort of strategy and growth related things. Um, you don't know what you're building. You know, you're not just implementing the latest version of Salesforce. Um, but this is interesting territory, right? And typically procurement and everybody's very comfortable with a flat fee type of thing. What we're trying to say in the studio is let's all put our money where our mouth is, right? If we don't hit the milestones, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be this full life cycle, but if we don't hit the milestones to move to the next one, just like a venture capital entrepreneur, you shouldn't, you shouldn't keep moving, right? And it's not to say it's a failure. You just might pivot or whatever. That's okay. But you need to come to some milestones, pick your head up and say, what is the data telling me about 
my hypothesis, i.e. I. your idea, um, you know, and what should I do with it next? And for us, if you're just paying the, the flat fee consulting doesn't align to the incentive of busting your butt every day, like an entrepreneur. And that's how we were showing up. But honestly, our clients weren't showing up that way. They're like, best of luck out there. You know, we'll, we'll be here. Let us know what you come up with. And you're like, well, this, this is not how this works. Like this thing's got to integrate. We got to talk about software. I mean, you know, and we really need, and again, we need to tie back to your strategy. And so it really makes this sort of a place where both teams can come together, small teams and say, let's build this thing. And we're, none of us are getting paid, you know, until, unless we hit these milestones. So it, it, it has a different business model as well. Yeah. That's a little bit about it. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I have to say, Kevin and Natalie, this has been a, a most fascinating dialogue and I know we can keep going here or continue the party, but uh, I'm going to hand off to you, Kwan, to kind of, you know, summarize quickly and then close this up. Wow. That was such an amazing discussion. I mean, li literally we could probably go on for another hour on this topic. <laughs> I think, you know, we covered a lot of ground here in a little bit, you know, two different domains areas in terms of where Kevin lives and where Natalie lives. But, you know, some common areas were around, you know, understanding the problem, right? I think that's that's critical. Defining it in a way that still allows for creativity, right, for this community to think through what the best solution is for that problem. Um, you know, I love Natalie's discussion on the hard work part of this and, you know, not focusing so much on the theater side of this. Um, I think that is still a struggle. And your last story about, you know, getting the client to roll up their sleeves and get in there with you, I think is also um, a challenge because it does a huge uh, change in the way, uh, for, especially for the government, right, Kevin, with the, the stakeholders that were involved there. Um, you know, this isn't about just handing it off and saying, okay, you guys consulting firm or, you know, SAIC, Momentum, go figure this out and come back and tell us when it works. It has to be a collaboration and it has to be iterative and get that feedback and pivot when we need to pivot. Um, so, so many, Prachi and I are so appreciative of you guys uh, joining us today. I think it definitely added some richness to all of our, you know, just the one-on-one -on -one conversations between the two of us. So we're really grateful for that. I just think that, you know, some other points around strategy, the right scope, uh, you know, the mindset and, and yeah. you know, the place of just having that right attitude. I mean, all of those are part of that equation. And maybe one day we'll all get together and, you know, develop that big mind map, right, to cover all of this and Kevin's big funnel and, you know, make sure that that there is a bit of an acceleration from one end of that funnel to the other one. So with that, I think uh, I really look forward to continue our dialogue. Thanks, guys. And uh, we're Thanks. so grateful for your time. Thanks, Natalie, Kevin, Prachi, and Kwan for a great collaboration. Each episode keeps getting better and better. Make sure you stay connected by subscribing to the Intersections channel or follow the I2C on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter at UAH I2C. Bye, everyone. Onward and upward.